Let's get started. So uh, my name is Brian Fox. I'm a co-founder and CTO at Sonatype. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and uh, an open SSF governing board member as well. So um, I've been living all things uh, supply chain for 15 years. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, the view that I have on that and how I've seen it uh, unfold during that time. So a little bit of context. Let's see. That first slide's always a tricky one. There we go. Um, this is the Maven Central Repository download. So Sonatype has always run the Maven Central Repository. That's pr predominantly Java, but also Scala and some other things. So if you're developing Java, and in the report I saw this morning, 50% or something like that, financial firms said they were heavily using Java. You probably all are. You're doing so with open source. You're getting that open source from our repository. Not a lot of people know that. And so that, that repository and the consumption patterns gives us really unique insights into what's going on, at least inside of that ecosystem. So we're on track to uh, about 700 billion downloads this year. Java shows no sign of slowing down. Um, NPM, same thing. This is a little bit of an older stat, but their, their growth looks about the same. So if you were to look at Docker Hub or anything like that, the point being open source consumption is exploding. Um, the number of things that the developers have to choose from are correspondingly exploding. And I pulled these from the, the, the report that Gabe announced just this morning. You guys might not have had a chance to see it yet. Um, this is the state of open source and financial services. Uh, supports the same thing. Open source consumption is uh, double the number, 48% from what it was just last year. Um, the number of people who are prohibiting it are very low, uh, getting even lower this year. And consumption, uh, why are we doing this? Increases productivity, right? That's why open source continues to be used more and more and more because we're sharing and able to build upon the shoulders of those that came before us. The result of this in a modern uh, system is that you're uh, pulling in components largely. Most of the modern package systems have binaries that are already built. You're not cutting and pasting open source code. You're actually pulling the binaries. What that means is you have a supply chain, right? And from my perspective, not enough people are actually recognizing that and using that pattern to their benefit. So if we take a step back for a minute, supply chains are everywhere, right? Think about it. Think about your cars. Think about your food. Think about the planes. And um, in, in the supply chain world, um, Edwards Deming is, is kind of like a superhero. He helped uh, the J Japanese auto industry rebuild after World War II and focused on a number of key things. Um, the important one here you know, is this last one, continuously track the location of every part. I mean, obviously, we know we want to choose better parts and all that stuff. But from my perspective, so many organizations are simply failing to do this thing here. Right? And this is really important. So if we think about this in terms of real-world implications, I tell a couple stories here that I like. Uh, this first one is the Chevy Cobalt. In 2014, they had a little bit of a fiasco um, because... What had happened was there was some, some uh, uh, basically a bug in the ignition switch where it was too easily turned from the run to the accessory mode. And if people had a heavy keychain or something happened, it shut the car off. The worst part about that is about two seconds after the car was shut off, the airbags stopped. So not only did their engine stop, they lost power steering and power brakes, their safety systems turned off too. People died. The problem was the engineers, at some point, they fixed this problem, and they didn't change the version number of the part, right? So anybody doing software recognizes this. This is the, yeah, it works on my machine, not your machine kind of problem. Like, I have a different version of a jar than you do, right? Tools like Maven and PyPy and NPM have tried to help solve that problem by making versioning very obvious and, and discouraging this. But this is a problem that happens in software, and when it happens in the real world, people die. The opposite of that is back when Boeing 787 launched, they had a, a, a potential similar fiasco with batteries that were catching on fire at the gate. But they were pretty quickly able to zero in that they were all related to a single manufacturer and a single batch because they did have supply chains. They were able to understand this, and they were able to... Um, to, to fix it very quickly, as opposed to what happened to Chevy, because there were parts on the shelf with the same version number that were still broken, even after they did the recall, they were putting broken switches into cars thinking they were fixing them. And then they had to do another recall and pull back all of those to fix it, right? Again, because of simple 
uh, configuration management failures in physical supply chains. And then there was a lesson the lettuce industry learned a couple years ago. Um, you, you might remember here in the U.S. there were a few years we had E. coli outbreaks. It was like two or three summers in a row. And the last one, the last big one that happened, it occurred when the lettuce growing season shifted from um, Arizona to California when people started to get sick. And so because the lettuce wasn't labeled with the region of origin, it made it impossible for them to figure out what was actually going on. And so what did we do? We threw out literally all of the romaine lettuce in like all of North America. And that's an economic disaster. It's an ecologic disaster. And a lot, of, lot more people got sick because of it. So what did they finally do after three years of this? They started labeling the bags with the region at least, if not the farm where it came from. So these industries were making mistakes um, that led to real problems. And, and I'll tell you, our industry is doing the same thing. And so we need to start thinking about this in terms of a supply chain. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at uh, patterns from other, other industries and, and, and kind of adopt the same practices. So from my perspective, I looked at what's happening over the time that I've been doing this, and I see three distinct phases of what's been happening. The first phase is really your old school exploiting open source vulnerabilities. So these are bugs that existed in the code. Somebody found out how to make it do something that was unintended and then exploited the heck out of it. Um, you know, when I first started, we were talking to financial firms who would tell me things like, well, one, we're not using open source. Um, because they thought open source meant Linux and MySQL and Firefox, when in fact those same people were downloading more components from our repository than anybody else in the world, because the leaders didn't understand that 90% of their modern application was actually open source components. And then they would tell me things like, well, I don't have to worry about that because I have a security team and a firewall. Right? So that was the perspective of a lot of people when I started doing this and started talking about this. Um, but the first one that really raised a lot of attention was the first Struts vulnerability. This was in 2013. Um, and this is a financial conference. It really resonated within the financial industry. We had a lot of customers and a lot of prospects really kind of flipping out about this one because Anonymous was trying to make a name for themselves. And a lot of banks took their websites offline for maintenance on the same day after this was released. So draw your own conclusions from that. But I know for a fact that the financial industry really started paying attention to this problem that I'm talking about here way back then, right? So I'm, a, I'm hopefully preaching a little bit to the converted here, but, um, but there's always something new for everybody. Uh, in 2014, we saw shell shock and heart bleed. This was the rise of uh, marketing around vulnerabilities, and you started to see it on the news, um, and, and people uh, paying attention to it, right, with outsized impact. And, and generally, the conversation started to shift from, I have a security team and a firewall, I don't have to worry about this, to, hmm, maybe I should pay attention to my open source. Again, small numbers, but it was starting to grow. In 2015, um, Commons Collection. Commons Collection is a very popular library from Apache that does things like linked list and hash sets and all that kind of stuff. It's so popular, it's like Log4j, can be assumed to be present on the class path of any Java application or at least the Java container that it's running in. Um, and this is a picture of Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. They were ransomwared by an attack leveraging Commons Collection a full year after this was disclosed at Black Hat and subsequently patched, right? And so this hospital was shut down for a week. They had no backups, no way to restore it. They ended up paying the ransom in order to get this uh, data back. But I, I bring this up because, you know, the old adage is humans, we don't act until somebody dies, right? Now, you shut down a hospital outside a major metropolitan area, it's going to have very real impact on lives. There are studies that have said that if you have a heart attack or a stroke in New York or Boston around the marathon days, you are significantly, uh, have, have significantly worse outcomes, simply because the ambulance has to route around the, 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 uh, the marathon route, and you know, minutes matter in those two things. And so, you know, mathematically, you can say this very likely killed some people. There have been, unfortunately, some stories since then, one in Germany where a woman had to be transferred for a hospital ransomware. She died because they couldn't get the stroke 
um, the blood clotting medicine to her. And there was another one, I think it was in Louisiana, Alabama, where a baby died because the ransomware shut off a monitor and they didn't realize the baby was uh, distra in distress. So these things have very real impact. We're not just talking about stealing of money. We're talking about very real societal impact from, frankly, our collective failure to do the right thing here. Um, if we talk about log for shell, right, who's not talking about this? Um, these are the statistics. Wow, that's really blurry for some reason. Um, these are the, I have a better slide of this later. Uh, the early statistics of the adoption, and you can see pretty quickly as an industry, we got to about 60% of the consumption was of the patched versions, and then they picked up all of those new ones. But about 40% of the consumption pattern was still of the known vulnerable versions. And that trend continued, shockingly, until about last month. We finally crossed into the below 30%, but it's taken us a whole year. So for a whole year, 30% of the consumption of this thing has been of the known vulnerable version that everybody and their brother knew about and was writing about what the heck is going on, right? If there's not better evidence of a supply chain failure than this, um, I don't know what there is. And, and there's a better picture that shows the full view, view of this later. So I raise this at this section because despite the wide impact of Log4j, this was a phase one. This was a bug. This was a coincidence of two features, frankly, that existed in the code base that people figured out how to exploit. This wasn't even one of the phase two or phase three types of attacks that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, and yet we still struggled a bit to deal with this. Um, China has been exploiting the heck out of this. This came out this summer. Um, they, this came out in October. National Security Agency has this at the top of the list uh, of Chinese uh, attacks still all this time. Not a surprise, given that people are still building stuff with it. Um, and I don't have a slide, but last month they came out and said Iran attackers were using this same uh, exploit to go against government agencies, right? So uh, some people say log for shell was a big uh, bunch of noise about nothing. Clearly, that's not true if the government is acting upon this. So if we think about phase two, what started in really 2017 um, was, was a new rise of a, the attackers actually moving to insert things into the supply chain, where previously it was a race between they figured it out, could they exploit it before you could patch it? That's what I used to talk about. Then in 2017, um, there were a couple things that happened. This was a study that found that in the NPM repository, uh, a majority of the things published here, uh, or the publishers, had weak you know, passwords. Either they were like password, or they checked them in the GitHub, and it was easily comp compromised. Coincidentally, or not, I don't think so, within a few weeks after that, we saw actually the first typo squatting attacks. So typo squatting using a confusingly similar name, an underscore instead of a dash, and confusing developers. Like, you're probably all familiar with this term at this point now, but five years ago, I was out there telling people this is happening, and I, I felt like you know, I was the only one seeing this. And what was really shocking about these two instances was that these things were stealing the open source publisher credentials. They weren't trying to steal social security numbers or credit card numbers. They were stealing open source maintainer credentials. And that was like a huge thing for me. I'm looking around going, am I the only one that sees this? Because this is really freaking scary that all of a sudden they're paying attention to the supply chain now. And then, not surprising, right after that, we saw an evolution of these attacks. Back in 2017, 2018, I was giving a version of this talk where I was kind of talking about, this happened last week. Did you hear about this? There is a tidal wave coming. And so we, we have all of this documented at our supply chain report down, you can see at the bottom, lots of details. But I felt like I was watching the attackers hone their craft in real time, that every one that came had elements of, it was like, it was like, COVID, where each new variant had attributes of the old ones and new things that made it worse is basically what was happening here. So the third phase that we're kind of still in now are these uh, uh, attacking the developers and the development infrastructure itself specifically using those supply chain attacks. So one of the first one, uh, this was a Jenkins that was unpatched. They were mining uh, Bitcoin back in the day. Uh, might be worth less than that now. I'm not sure I should do the math and update the slide. But it was a lot of money. It got a lot more and then probably came back down. Um, what happened here? I lost my pointer. There we go. 
That was weird. Um, and so last year, there was another one where an attack got into Verkata, a camera company, where they went in through the development infrastructure, and they were able to move laterally around the organization, getting into the actual camera feeds, right? So attacks on the development infrastructure is not just isolated. These are the back doors that allow you to get into an organization. And, um, and they're using this through upstream types of attacks. So this was one. Um, CodeCov was another one. This was a popular tool that was breached, and so everybody who had this tool in their infrastructure also was vulnerable, and there were a number of attacks that were attributed to this one as well. Um, and so what we've seen is this evolution of additional types of attacks going on within the development infrastructure. And if you think about inversion of, uh, not inversion, uh, infrastructure as code that exists in many organizations now, it means the development infrastructure potentially has the keys to the kingdom, to the production kingdom is why the attackers are going there. And so, um, you know, last year also there was a new attack. Um, it, this started as white hat research saying, I, if I figure out the name of a, a NPM module that you're using internally, and then I go to the public repo and I publish it with a very high version number, your tool that's looking for the latest can't tell the difference and will download the attacked one. So this was initially research that went out and he collected a bunch of bug bounties um, but we watched pretty quickly as, first, there was a huge flurry of, of copycats going after bug bounties. We saw uh, it was 7,000% within the first week of those types of attacks. But buried within those were malicious ones, where they were taking even the proof of concept code, but actually using it to steal credentials and go after act, dropping actual backdoors. And that trend actually continues today. Um, the attackers are still focused on, on this type of problem. Um, we, I have a slide later, but we've identified over 103,000 instances of this using some of the automated MLAI techniques that we have. Um, because it was the only way for us to keep our customers safe. You know, these things are happening every single day still, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. Now, why is this happening? Well, this uh, study is a little bit old, but still somewhat shocking. Way back in 2016, the worldwide global drug trade as an industry was $435 billion. That same year, it was, uh, uh, cybercrime was already a bigger industry. And if we think way back then, we weren't talking about this. Right? This seems less shocking now, but what is still a little bit shocking is that last year it grew to $6 trillion. And it's predicted to get to $10.5 trillion just a couple more days. Now, if you flip this around and you think about the motivations of the attackers, this is the VC funds that are investing in them to attack our infrastructure. They're getting this money from us. They're getting it from our insurance companies. Um, and they're using it to get more and more sophisticated against us because we're making it easy for them, right? So this is why these rise, these rise of attacks are happening and why they're not going to go away. And also, the attackers are engineers, so they're looking for the easy way. And this was a, a study that looked at the NPM repository interconnection. At the time, they found that if you were able to get to just a few uh, maintainers, you could affect nearly half of the components in the entire NPM repository. And if you flip it around, you could target just a few packages and get millions of downloads, right? So of those 103,000 uh, instances I talked about, most of them are in NPM. A handful of them are in Python. So far, none of them have been in Java. And, and we can have a side conversation about why that is. It has to do with some of the fundamentals of Maven and some of the things we do to manage that repo. Um, but they're, slim, they're easy pickings for the, for the attackers right now. And so, you know, that growth of those attacks has really exploded. In the first few years, you know, there were a handful, like I said, I used to be able to walk everybody through the progression when, you know, I could count them on two hands. Um, but then it, it, it exploded to 216, following year 430%. Year after that, 650%. And then um, we, when we look back over it, uh, it's been an average of 742% year over year for the last three years. Right? So this rise is not a coincidence with that rise of the money that they're collecting from us and then turning around um, and being incented to go after more. Right? And so this is the, the 103,000 uh, slide that I was talking about. So... Um, we did some interesting stuff here. You guys would all probably understand this. We, we modeled our uh, approach after credit card fraud detection, 
because every new, every new uh, type of attack was not exactly like the other. So we couldn't, we couldn't just build heuristics to recognize what was malicious, but what we could do is recognize what was normal and identify the unusual types of things. Just like when I travel, my credit card gets used at restaurants and all this stuff all over the world, but I don't go to Southern California. I live in New Hampshire. I don't go to Southern California, go to Walmart and buy a bunch of TVs. That's unusual. That's, that transaction is going to get blocked instantly. So we do basically the same thing for new packages, and, and um, we're able to protect our customers that way. And so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing. We could talk about it outside the conference if you, if you want. Um, so what do we do about this? In the wake of Log4j, this was my perception of what was happening in the industry. All of these articles were being written that were missing the point. They were freaking out like, oh, my gosh, uh, these are free projects, and we're dependent upon them. And uh, the the feds should get involved. And um, you know nobody's paying them. They're amateurs. And uh, look, open source developers are not amateurs. Most of them aren't even volunteers. These are the people who want to do nothing else but write code all day, every day, and they do cool stuff. And a lot of times, their employers are paying for them. But the outside world kind of figured out or thought that this was like a bunch of you know college kids writing code that didn't know what they were doing, which really frustrated the heck out of me. Um, you know, and, and freaking out that, oh my gosh, we're all dependent on this free software, let's get some policy. Right? So the, the world kind of over-rotated in my perspective towards all these things, which I'll call, classify as like fix open source, educate them, make better tools, do all these kinds of things. Um, and and um, I think they're missing the point. Imagine if, remember the Takata airbag, imagine if the manufacturer said, you know what, we're not going to do recalls. We're going to pay Takata more, and we're going to do a better job next time. That's what all those things that the world is asking about open source. And reality is they didn't really do that. They said, no, we know exactly which cars are affected. We know when they need to get recalled. I just had one in a truck replaced like six months ago because they knew that for the first three years or so, it was safe. So they were able to phase it out because it had detailed understanding of every part and everything. And so this is that log4j year on view, which kind of tells me a whole bunch of companies out there don't have an understanding of where those parts are. Because I can't think of a logical reason why they wouldn't have updated. Even if you could prove you weren't exploitable, everybody was asking everybody else, vendor con, uh, con, consultant type of relationships, if they patched and how they mitigated. So even if you knew it, you were going to update just so you didn't have to answer, yes, I'm still using it, and then explain why that's okay to your banks and your insurance companies, right? And yet, this is still where we are. And so we did some, some uh, studies this year. Again, at that URL, you can see the details. We looked at the vulnerability the things that were being downloaded that were vulnerable at the time they were being downloaded from Central across all vulnerabilities, 96% of the time when somebody was pulling something from the repo, there was already a fix available, right? So all of that work on the left-hand side, um, why does this keep stopping on me? All of that, that work on the left-hand side is solving 4% of the problem, right? And so really, we need to get organizations to make better choices, have an organizational view of all of the components that they're doing, and then be able to manage that response. And that's really the part that I've been focused on this whole time, because from the download statistics way back when, we recognized that that was actually the problem. Way back in 2011, we looked at it and we saw that Bouncy Castle, a, a Java crypto library, the most popular version of it happened to be the one that had a level 10 vulnerability found and fixed over a year later. So even back then, we were able to identify this same trend, um, and, and not enough people believed us, I think. But now, now we're starting to get to that point. So we've also looked at um, some studies over the years. A few years ago, we got to the point where 50% had some process in place and 37% had automated tooling. That's great because when we started surveying people, these were in the teens, but I'm a little bit of a jaded person. Would you accept those statistics for these things if only half of the parts in your car were supposed to be there? No. So, so we should be happy that it's not teens anymore and it's 50%, but as all of these statistics I've shown you, we still have a long way to go. 
And the good news is, you know, we have examples where it really works. This is an example of someone using uh, our, our tooling to help do it. When log for shell happened, it was basically a nothing burger for them. They had 80% of their 4,000 portfolio remediated in the first four days, and they basically hit 100% in weeks after that. We've talked to other financial companies where they said, yeah, it took us 100 days to understand which applications we had log for j in, right? So that's a big deal. I don't know how it was for you guys, but maybe, maybe somewhere in between these two things. When we look at it across the board, you know, you can see vast differences in companies that have tooling in place versus those that don't. Shouldn't be surprised, right? So, um, so the point being, you have a supply chain, even if you don't manage it, the attackers are using this against you. Um, you know, if I told you about a new vulnerability today, literally sometimes I get that opportunity. Something breaks as I'm about to talk, and I can announce something. Um, could you tell me, are you using this component anywhere in your organization? So many places can't even do that basic thing. Um, if you can do that, do you know exactly which applications it's in? Can you track the remediation of it, right? If you don't know what you have, you can't even do this. And how long would it take you to deploy an update? Because that's what you're racing against. Um, and so worse, how would you avoid the next malicious release? You have zero time to respond. The thing is taking action as soon as your developers download it. They're dropping back doors. They're exfiltrating, exfiltrating credentials. And in a COVID work from home environment, a lot of the perimeter defenses that might have existed in many organizations don't. So where a back door might not have actually been able to deliver the payload inside an office, if they're at home on their home network or in a coffee shop, that may not be true. So the pandemic has accidentally made this uh, quite a bit worse, right? And so, you know, the, the point that I want to make here is that, um, you know, we have a factory, Deming principles, and focusing on traditional application security things, focusing on is this thing safe before I ship it and I rele release it, that makes better products. So in the auto manufacturing, it's making the cars better, faster, cheaper. Right? But what is it not doing? It's not defending the factory against an intentional suicide bomber or whatever type of intentional sabotage. That's what the attackers are doing to our development infrastructure in this phase three. This is happening every single day. Right? And they're, they're using it to great effect to move around the organization. And then finally, a couple years ago, we, we did uh, some other research and we looked at organizations and we said, Based on their survey response, we kind of put them into different categories. You know, in the first category here, security is the most important thing, even if it slows down development, and then the polar opposite of them or whatever, we're just going to ship stuff as fast as we can, security be damned, right? So there's two polar opposites of that. And then there are people in the middle that are kind of trying to do the sensible thing. Now, if I told you that the people that were focused on being fast... Um, you know, paid a penalty in security, and so it's probably worthwhile to slow down a little bit and do some security, and that's the right thing. After everything I just told you, I think everybody would go, yeah, that makes sense. Let's go a little bit slower because the security matters. But what we actually found is when we put it all together is that the people that were doing both were both faster and more secure than the organizations who only cared about one dimension or the other. And that seems kind of surprising, but if you stop and think about it, these people who only cared about shipping fast, they didn't get a free pass when Log4J happened. They still had to deal with it, but they had no tooling or process in place to do it sensibly, right? And, and the people that have very draconian security practices, I mean, of course, they're going slower, um, but because there's a little bit of mashing of gears and everybody's accepting risk and waving things and pretending like these don't matter, um, things don't get fixed, so it actually reduces their their security footprint, right? So the point being, this is one of these classic win-win situations where you can actually be faster, be more innovative, and be more secure if you stop and think about this. Think about it like a mature uh, supply chain. And so if you want to think about or see more of the stuff that I talked about, um, including the last eight-year reports, you can find them all here. So pretty much all of the, all of the charts that I showed came from one of these, these years. So I think that's about my time. Um, thank you for coming. Hopefully this was uh, informative. <clears throat> I don't actually know what time I'm supposed to leave. Do I have time for questions? Do you know? I have two minutes? Okay, I could take one quick question if somebody wants. No? Okay, all right. 
Yeah. So, you see that changing? I'm definitely worried about it changing, but I think the attacks will be different. So real quick, there's two reasons why that is the case. PyPy, NPM, and some other ecosystems um, default to updating the latest. So every time there's a build, unless you told it not to, it's going to grab the latest. For an attacker, that's a ready-made audience. I put something out there, I got millions of downloads. So it makes it a target for that reason. The other reason is um, on Maven, we have namespacing, the group ID, which correlates to the Java package, which is usually the company's domain, so com.sonatype or com.fidelity or whatever, right? And so when, when pub, people publish the things, we validate that they control that namespace. We validate that they own the domain or something else like that, or a GitHub project can only use their GitHub name. So you can't show up to our repository and pretend to be Apache and publish something that is a typo away from struts. Nobody's going to do it. So because Maven has that and because Sonatype enforces it, it makes it harder for them to do it, but also because Maven doesn't prefer the latest by default, it makes it less of a target. So those are the reasons why it's happening over there. I am worried, and we're doing some work and some other things. I think that they will be the next generation type of attack where they figure out how to get nefarious code into an actual popular project, which is a much harder problem to solve and, and isn't just a, a package repository problem to solve, actually. So that's, that's the reason why that's, that's different. All right, thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.